Hello, and welcome back to another episode of The Hat Historian. In this slightly longer episode, I will be talking about not one, but three hats, arguably the first modern combat helmets, which show the shifting nature of warfare during the First World War, whose increasingly brutal combat made them necessary. The Adrian helmet, the Brody helmet, and the Stahlhelm. The Helmets of World War I. World War I was a war the likes of which had never been seen. Brought about by a web of alliances, within weeks all of Europe descended into conflict. That is a story that has had entire libraries written about it. It was a new kind of war, total, industrial, with technologies that made killing easier, faster, and had appalling casualties. To try and help protect their troops from the shrapnel caused by new artillery, the three main powers, Germany, France, and the UK, each developed a new kind of steel helmet, interestingly each loosely inspired by medieval models, to replace the cloth or leather hats they had gone to war with. Since almost the beginnings of human conflict, warriors realized that they needed to protect themselves to give them an edge in combat through the use of armor. The most important part to protect, it should go without saying, is the head, and so helmets were created, first leather, then bronze and later steel, to shield the head from blows and cuts. Famous models from antiquity are instantly recognizable, made by the Greeks or Romans, which offered heavy protection to the head and cheeks. Viking raiders and barbarian invaders had their own, often simpler, and I'm afraid without horns, that's a legend, and various models of all shapes, sizes, degrees of protection, and quality of ornamentation continued throughout the Middle Ages. Those uncommon foot soldiers were often fairly wide and with a crest or point, as I mentioned in the Pickelhaube video, to protect from arrows and to deflect sword blows. But inherently, these steel helmets were heavy, uncomfortable, and expensive for the leader to supply. Things changed with European armies in the 16th century with the introduction of gunpowder and the start of what would become linear warfare. While slower to reload, firearms were much more powerful and could penetrate most forms of armor from a distance, rendering them obsolete. Furthermore, because of their inaccuracy, they tended to be fired in large volleys by lines, which would not therefore come into close contact with each other. With the necessity for them heavily diminished, the heavy, uncomfortable, and expensive helmets were gradually discarded in favor of large-brimmed hats that could protect from the elements, and would eventually be formed into whatever style was prevalent during that time, such as tricorns or bicorns, as you can see in my videos on the subject. The one exception to this was cavalry, which would retain breastplates and helmets, as they were expected to come into closer contact with the enemy, so would need protection from bayonets or swords. With the Napoleonic Wars, armies adopted new styles, designed not so much to protect, but, in the logic of these lines of troops, to project height and power. Soldiers were issued tall shakos or bearskins, which were somewhat impractical, but did make the men appear much taller. The excesses of this period were tempered afterwards as the weapons became more accurate and soldiers requested more practical headgear. In the 19th century, European armies, and all those who were influenced by them, which is to say most of the world, generally wore, with few exceptions, either soft cloth caps, like kippies or forge caps of some kind, or some kind of leather or cork helmet, all of which I've covered before. These had the advantage of being distinctive in an era before camouflage was necessary and a big concern, and helped protect the wearer from the sun, cold, rain, or whatever element was relevant at the time. However, though the leather versions might shield to some extent from sword blows, they were otherwise completely ineffective at protecting the wearer from any kind of strike. But as World War I started, troops went to what was widely expected to be a short conflict wearing their national headgear, thinking it adequate, as it has always been before. Circumstances soon proved them wrong, with French warfare and new shrapnel artillery causing such a great number of casualties due to head wounds that something needed to be done. The first out of the gate were the French. French soldiers went to war in 1914 wearing the Modèle 1884 képi, which I've talked about before, as part of their very outdated uniform. Some experiments had been made to change it, including one with a large brimmed hat and one with a pith helmet, but none had come to fruition before war broke out. While comfortable, distinctive, cheap and practical, it was already outdated even by pre-war standards, with its bright red color making it far too visible. The army tried to resolve this by issuing more discreet blue covers, but there was another major problem that was noted, that of head wounds. With trench warfare setting in, a new tactic was to shell the enemy with shrapnel rounds which were designed to explode above the trenches and shower the soldiers below in shards of metal. Furthermore, soldiers peering over the edge could be hit by conventional artillery, 
By the spring of 1915, 77% of all wounds were to the head, with 80% of these being fatal. Something had to be done, and so the French army launched the development of a new kind of helmet. But as this would take time, they tried to come up with a stopgap measure to try and help protect the soldiers. A small metal bowl called a cervelière, or brain bowl, was issued to the troops. Originally intended to be worn under the kepi's lining, it was extremely uncomfortable, and when worn, was usually just plopped on top. However, this was still rather ineffective, and most ended up as food bowls, shaving cups, and containers for spare ammo. Finally though, on May 21st, 1915, a helmet design ordered by Army Intendant Louis Adrien was presented and approved. Originally named M15 Helmet, it was soon referred to as the Adrien, after the man who launched its production. Arguably the world's first modern combat helmet, it was designed with the help of Louis Kuhn and the Japy Frère Metalworks. It was made from 0.7mm thick steel and composed of five parts, a dome-shaped crown, a two-part brim, a crest on the top, and a branch insignia pinned on the front. It was said to have been inspired by 19th century cavalry and firefighter helmets, which in turn have their origins in the medieval bourguignot. The distinctive crest on top, no mere decoration, strengthened the helmet against blows from above and covered a ventilation slit. The insignia on the front varied depending on the wearer's branch of service. 1.6 million were originally ordered to be distributed in the summer of 1915, a number upped to over 3 million by the year's end. It soon proved itself effective, with the number of casualties caused by head injuries dropping from 77% as I said earlier to just 22% by 1916. However, that does not mean that it didn't have its faults. Originally painted a glossy horizon blue, it was deemed too shiny and visible, and at first soldiers tried to counter this by smearing mud or covering it in cloth, which made whatever head wounds did penetrate it more susceptible to infection. I should note that, contrary to our popular belief, both then and now, that it was not able nor ever designed to stop direct hits from rifle rounds. The manufacturers changed the painting process to render the paint matte, solving the issue. The Adrien helmet proved so effective that more than 20 other countries ordered their own versions, with such diverse places as Belgium, Brazil, China, Czechoslovakia, Peru, Poland, Romania, Russia, and others issuing their own versions, the only difference being the color and the insignia pinned to the front. Winston Churchill, while serving in France, was even gifted one that he can be seen wearing on some portraits and photographs. All told, over 20 million were produced, and the helmet has become emblematic in France and many other countries of World War I, but its service continued well past that conflict, both in its country of origin and elsewhere. The Soviets used it for many years, as can be seen in this World War II American recognition card that definitely did not age well. It remained the standard helmet of the French army throughout the interwar years, getting an updated design in 1926, which simplified its somewhat complex manufacturing process and strengthened it by making the crown and visor a single pressed sheet. It was the helmet worn by French forces during the defeat of 1940, and though it still continued to be worn during the war by some French forces, it was largely abandoned by those who had escaped to join the Allies in favor of British and American models, and after the war it was not readopted by the French army, who used models based on American designs. But that does not mean that it ceased to be used completely. The French riot police and gendarmerie used versions of it well into the 1960s, as can be seen in these pictures of the 1968 student riots, and it was used in similar uses in other countries that had adopted it. It was also used by French firemen into the 1980s, and still features in the dress uniforms of some units such as the Paris Fire Brigade. Finally, though outclassed by modern composite helmets in weight, comfort, and resistance to impact, it was found in a 2015 study by Duke University to be better than current helmets at protecting from shockwaves from above, undoubtedly as they concluded due to its crest that diffuses them. So a hundred years later, the venerable Adrien still has a few tricks up its hat. Next to adopt a helmet for combat, soon after the French, were the British and their empire. British troops went to war in 1914 wearing the khaki service dress cap, which had been introduced in 1905. And before anybody says anything in the comments, I know this is not actually a service dress cap, which had a wire in the crown giving it a stiff shape. This is a replica of the later soft service dress cap, which was introduced after helmets were issued, as it could be folded up and stuffed in a pocket when the helmet was being worn. But it's the closest I've got, so you'll have to live with it. It was smart, discreet, at least more so than the French red kippy or the German pickelhaube, had a visor to shield the eyes from the sun, and was generally well liked by the troops. However, its stiff shape made it difficult to store when not being worn on the head, leading some soldiers to remove the wire, and it gave the men a distinctive silhouette which could make them easier targets. Furthermore, much like the French kippy that I just talked about, it offered no protection against blows or shrapnel, causing a great number of casualties from head wounds. In 1915, 
Around the same time the French were starting their design of the Adrien, the British War Office started their own study for a helmet. The French model was deemed too complex to manufacture, being made of five individual parts, for a British industry still catching up to the needs of an all-out war. Soon, a round, plate-shaped design, somewhat reminiscent of the medieval Chapelle de Fer, was decided upon. It was purportedly designed by a Latvian immigrant born Leopold Brode, but who anglicized his name to John Leopold Brody, who patented the design. However, Brody's patent was more about the lining than the helmet's shape, whose design was claimed by several others. But Brody's name appeared on all the helmet linings, and so became associated with it. This new design had the advantage over the French one of being composed of a single piece of steel, making it more resistant and faster to produce. The shallow bowl shape, with a wide top, offered protection to the neck and lower head, though it was designed for trench warfare and shrapnel shells exploding from above, and its wide shape protected the shoulders to some extent. While slightly more resistant than the French Adrien, it was also heavier, around 1 kilogram to the Adrien 700 grams. The new tin hat, as soldiers soon called it, was introduced in the fall of 1915. Originally, due to production troubles, there weren't enough for every soldier, and so the helmets were left at the front to be used by the men rotating in, who then left them for the next group, and otherwise wore the soft service cap I was wearing earlier. By the spring of 1916, a quarter million had been produced, and it became standard issue for all men in the summer of that year and by then head injuries had diminished by 75%, showing its effectiveness. However, it was not without some early flaws. As I mentioned, its shallow shape made it slightly less protective for the back of the neck than other helmet designs, and much like the Adrien, early models were too shiny and could give a soldier's position away. The latter problem was resolved with paint changes and cloth covers. The helmet was not only issued to British troops, but also to soldiers from all over the empire that participated, from Canada to Australia to South Africa, who all wore uniforms generally similar to the British model, with only minor differences. In 1917, with the entry of the United States into the war, General Pershing and his staff sought a helmet to equip the otherwise slouch hat wearing doughboys. Both the Brody and the Adrien were studied, and while the Adrien was issued to units who were generally assigned to French sectors, Pershing selected the Brody model as the standard, firstly because the British by that time had a surplus available and 400,000 could be bought right away, and because its simpler construction was deemed more efficient for manufacture in the United States, as the M1917. By the war's end, over 7.5 million had been produced, and it has become an enduring symbol of the conflict throughout the Anglophone world, much like the Adrien is in the Francophone one. But its service did not end with World War I. It continued to be the standard helmet for Commonwealth and US forces through the interwar years, by now usually locally produced with a few improvements in the lining, but otherwise generally unchanged. It was used by all of these at the start of World War II, and was also issued to civilian police and civil defense units during the Blitz. A civilian model based on the Brody, called the Zuckerman, was also available for purchase, though many were made of inferior materials and were largely ineffective. Outside of the context of trench warfare, though, some of its protective shortcomings started to be noticed. The US Army used it until 1942, when it introduced the now famous M1 helmet, and the British forces started phasing in the more protective Mark III Turtle helmet. The original dish-shaped Brody continued to be in service in some Commonwealth forces well after the war, however, with Canada, for instance, using it until the 1960s, and is now intimately linked in people's mind with the Allied effort in the Great War, with it appearing in many films and series set in the era, superseding the less mediatized Adrien. Finally, on the opposing side, we have the Germans. The German army went to war with the legendary Pickelhaube, or spiked helmet, which is the subject of another of my videos. Very distinctive, made of leather and brass, it was a subject of pride amongst the German commanders, but like the hats above, it was not adapted to this new warfare. Concessions to modernity had been made, a cloth cover had been issued to hide the shiny brass ornaments when in the field, and in 1915 the spike was made detachable to not give away the soldier's position in the trenches. But while as a helmet it did offer some protection from sword blows, his leather construction didn't protect much more from shrapnel than the other nation's cloth caps. With the war intensifying, head injuries became a bigger and bigger problem. Much like the French, a stopgap measure was tried in the form of the Gerder skullcap, but that wasn't very effective. Thus, despite reticence from the traditionalist German leaders, studies were therefore started on a new kind of helmet for the troops. The helmet they eventually came up with was designed by Dr. Friedrich Schwerd, who had conducted studies on head wounds and incorporated his findings in the final design. Roughly similar to a medieval salad, his helmet had a distinctive coal scuttle shape that provided good protection to the head and neck while not impeding the wearer's vision. It was a little more complicated to manufacture than the Brody, necessitating several stampings rather than a single one, but was made of a harder, more resistant steel. It also had two large horns, lugs on the side of the head, that were designed to hold a bulletproof armor plate, 
that was used by sentries, machine gunners, and snipers who tended to stick their head above the trenches more often, as, like other helmets, it was neither able nor intended to stop a direct hit from a rifle round. These lugs also hid air vents. 30,000 were initially ordered and used by assault troops on a trial basis to the satisfaction of military leaders. Then, by 1916, it was ordered to be mass-produced and issued to all troops, therefore becoming known as the Stahlhelm M1916, literally steel helmet model 1916. It proved very effective, greatly reducing the number of head injuries like its allied counterparts, though the armor attachment proved very unpopular as it was very heavy, and therefore was rarely used. However, the helmet itself was quite well liked, and became to the Germans just as much of a symbol of their army as the Pickel Harbor had been before. It was also exported to German allies to some extent, with the Austrians buying many after they had trouble producing their own very similar design. A brimless version was also produced to the Ottomans, which was intended to not hinder their prayers, as Muslims have to touch their head to the ground. But few were actually delivered. After the German defeat in 1918, the new Reichswehr was greatly reduced by the Treaty of Versailles, but still used the Stahlhelm, with very slight modifications. It continued during the interwar period largely unchanged until 1935. The new regime, gearing up for an eventual war, wanted to update the helmets. The general coal scuttle shape was kept, but the size of the helmet was reduced while the steel itself was improved, making it both lighter and stronger. The mostly useless lugs on the sides were removed, and the liner was made more comfortable. This model 1935 style helm became infamous as the helmet worn by the Wehrmacht during World War II, though it was also exported to many other countries, such as China or several countries in South America. After the war, while the helmet had been quite effective, its appearance was a little too charged with connotations for the new Federal Republic to use, and they adopted a style closer to the American one. The classic style helm did continue to be used by German firefighters, however, and continues to some extent to this day in a composite version. A model very close to the original version is also a part of the dress uniform of the very German-influenced Chilean army. Its shape, too practical to pass up, was also resurrected in the 1980s with the new composite Pasked helmet of the US Army, and several other countries developed their own very similar Kevlar helmet, including the modern Bundeswehr. I assume enough time has passed for the unfortunate resemblances to no longer matter. Thus, the Stahlhelm, despite being on the losing side of two world wars, still remains relevant to this day. These three helmets, Adrian, Brody, and Stahlhelm, in their own way mark the turn in military thinking between the traditional wars of the 19th century and the modern industrial wars of the 20th. While the change had already been happening, these were truly a stark, visible acknowledgement that war was to be brutal, utilitarian, and total. Other helmets had been tried by some countries during World War I, but these three were the first, most widespread, and most influential. They would remain the standard until the next World War, and some of the design choices still affect the shapes and choices applied to combat helmets today. And the need for them is yet another reminder that, for all that leaders try and dress it up, war is a brutal business. Be it in the war to end all wars, or all the ones that came after it. So I hope once again you found this video interesting and will join me again soon for another hat. Until then, I tip my hat to you.